Welcome to Legal Minds. This is my second video on the separation of powers. I've got to talk a little quieter than I usually do because people are sleeping. But I'm going to try and uh, speak as clear as I can. This video is going to be a lot more informative than the last, which was just a brief introduction to the topic. In this one, I will be discussing the overlaps that are present within our government system. So the overlaps that are present um, within the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. And I'll also be discussing some of the checks and balances that are in place that may rectify this issue, the, the, the issue that we don't have a true separation of powers in the UK. I'm not saying that these checks and balances do correct the issue. I'm not saying it's even an issue. Um, some constitutional theorists do not believe that our overlaps are even a problem at all. But nevertheless, I will um, discuss the overlaps that are present and the so-called checks and balances that may rectify um, the issues that could occur as a result of these overlaps. So just to quickly recap the introduction in the previous video, I uh, said that the concept of separation of powers derives from 17th century philosopher Montesquieu, who believed that um, without a separation of power, there can be no liberty. I mentioned that there are three branches of government that you need to know these, that it's essential you know these branches, that, that you know the personnel and you know their function. Uh, I went over the weighed standards, which are a good way in assessing whether or not we have separation of powers or the extent to which we have a separation of power. And the weighed standards are that uh, there should be no overlap in personnel, no overlap in function, and no one government body should interfere with or exercise control over another government body. I also spoke about the US model, which is the epitome of separation of powers. That's the, a perfect example of what absolute separation of powers is like. In the UK, that's not the case. It's not so clear cut. There are very, very clear overlaps in personnel and in function. And if Montesquieu was alive today, if he still shared the same view that he did previously, then he would be disgusted at the uh, overlaps we have because they are very blatant overlaps and Montesquieu obviously felt very passionately about uh, the need for a separation of power because he said that liberty depends on it essentially that there can be no liberty without true separation of power however as I said it, you know t some constitutional theorists do not see it as a problem they do not see these overlaps as an issue uh, Walter Bigot I'm sure that's how you pronounce the second name believes that the overlaps in our um, government system are essentially the efficient secret of our constitution um, and that it allows for an effective practical government and this kind of makes sense in a way if you think about it because if there was true separation of powers then th th this may lead to a lot of conflict within um, the uh, going on between the government organs as is the case um, in the USA and not only that but because some constitutional theorists see our government bodies as working together which again does make sense that's kind of what they do and as a result, this is this leads to a, uh, a a practical way of doing things. So I'm not going to necessarily discuss whether or not the overlaps due to present are an issue. I would discuss both sides. I'll say they are an issue. I'll say they aren't an issue. I'll discuss the checks and balances. And uh, I really hope this video will be informative. Right, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to discuss one of the overlaps, whether it be in functional personnel, then I'm going to discuss the checks and balances. So if you look on the slide, on this, this particular slide, it says executive slash legislature one. So in the next slide, it will be checks and balances one, which means the checks and balances to um, the, the, the content of this slide. So the first overlap I'm going to discuss is the overlap in function, or you could say interference, that the executive has over the legislature. The executive exerts much control over the legislature. You could say that the executive is the dominant body in the sense that 
it's concerned with policy and Parliament passes laws to reflect and essentially implement that policy. So think of it this way. The executive is active and Parliament remain somewhat passive because they aren't truly active. I mean, they are active, but they're not as active until the executive um, does, you know, conducts research, looks for areas of law needed reform uh, and then you know, informs Parliament as to their findings and then Parliament then passes laws based on those findings. And for this reason, um, Lord Hailsham, I'm sure that's how you pronounce it, I'm, I don't know with these names, but uh, Lord Hailsham referred to the executive as an elective dictatorship uh, for the reason that the executive, um, which is not supposed to be our primary lawmaker, is telling our primary lawmaker what to do. From a separation of powers standpoint, that's a problem. The, the legislature should be deciding what to make laws about. The executive should not be telling the legislature what they can make laws about. And you could say that in an indirect way, this affects the judiciary. This, this overlap further extends to the judiciary. Why? Well, we know that the, the judiciary is supposed to, the judges are supposed to interpret Parliament's intention. They're supposed to um, discover what Parliament's will is when they're interpreting legislation and apply that to the facts of the issues in question, to the issues at hand, to the case. Now, if Parliament is passing legislation that reflects public policy that's based on the will of the executive, could it be said that the judges are really just interpreting a watered down will of the executive? If the answer to that is yes, then essentially the judiciary, the, the judges are not interpreting the will of parliament, they're interpreting the will, the will of the executive. However, I will say that I spoke to my lecturer, one of my public law lecturers about this. Um, I asked him what his take was on this and he essentially said that comments like these um, undermine the judiciary. I didn't put that right on the slide. I don't know what the heck I wrote there. I put comments like the judiciary. Ignore what's on the slide. I meant to write comments like these undermine the judiciary. That's essentially what he said. And th these comments fail to take into account that judges are very professional and are very, very keen to uphold the rule of law. That's what my lecturer said. That was his response to um, the the idea that the, the control the executive has, o has over the legislature um, affects the judiciary in an indirect way. There are, however, uh, certain checks and balances in place that may rectify this issue. One of them being that Parliament can vote the executive out through a vote of no confidence. So if the legislature becomes too suspicious as to what the executive is doing, uh, if it starts to uh, feel that its policy uh, is, is, is too absurd or if they disagree with it too much, they may vote the executive out through a voting of confidence. And this happened to James Callaghan in 1979, who essentially lost by uh, one vote. <coughs> And so in the minds of the executive, they're not going to want to do certain things. This is kind of a, a warning to them that their power is uh, has been limited by this because they are not going to want to be voted out. And then there's Prime Minister's question time in which the Prime Minister is put under very intense scrutiny. Of course, knowing that uh, the executive is going to have to... Uh, answer questions the people are going to want and are going to want answers to what they are doing people the people want to know why they are doing what they do then they may pre be prevented from doing so knowing that the prime minister is going to have to answer for them uh, it, during prime minister's question time there is the uh, convention on ministerial responsibility and under this convention the ministers have to remain accountable uh, for the conduct of their department. They have to remain accountable to Parliament for the conduct of their department. So they're required to explain the conduct of their department. This itself is going to act as a check on their power, as a balance. 
because they have to remain accountable. They're, they're going to not want to do certain things knowing that they're going to have to explain their conduct. They're going to have to explain the conduct of their department. And if a departmental error is made, then they may be required to resign. Required to resign if they mislead Parliament in some way, if they lie to Parliament or mislead them. As was the case with Stephen Byers. I actually covered that in my uh, video on ministerial responsibility. I would recommend you check out that video. It does link to, uh, to the separation to separation of powers in some ways. So I would advise that you, you look at that video too. However, the executive can still have some internal influence on the legislature simply because uh, ministers are also members of the legislature. Now, through this overlap in personnel, the executive uh, can take part in parliamentary proceedings such as votes and debates and uh, thus influence the legislature in their lawmaking. So there is some internal influence which some would regard as a problem. Uh, although section 2 subsection 1 of the House of Commons Disqualifications Act 1975 does limit the amount of ministers who can sit and vote in the House of Commons to 95 which can be said to some uh, degree rectify this overlap. Furthermore, uh, the Convention of Ministerial Responsibility requires ministers to solely commit to the cabinet and not to the legislature. Their main priority is uh, the cabinet and so, again, this may act as a balance on power. However, whether or not uh, these act as a check uh, or balance is really subject to debate. Firstly, although the number of ministers are limited to 95 in, in the House of Commons, this does not guarantee that the executive will not influence parliamentary proceedings. Secondly, the convention uh, of ministerial responsibility can be said to be a weak convention. Uh, the, the case of um, AG and Jonathan Cape shows that it's not legally enforceable. Sanctions uh, are only political ones, not legal ones. And also, if a minister is well respected and valued, uh, they may not be pressured to resign at all, thus rendering this so-called check a very flawed and weak one. An example would be Claire Short, who uh, who disagreed with the government's stance on the Iraq war, uh, yet she didn't resign when she was required to. She did eventually resign because she just kept on disagreeing. She kept on speaking out against them in the media. But when she was required to resign, according to, to the convention anyway, uh, she didn't because she wasn't pressured to resign simply because she was a well-respected female minister who gave, who uh, made it seem that the executive values, that, that the cabinet values equality. And oftentimes the convention itself has been suspended. Uh, as I said, if you look at my video on ministerial responsibility, uh, I give many examples of that. So if the convention itself is weak, is it really going to act as a check or a balance? And oftentimes the convention itself has been suspended, even though there are different elements uh, of the particular convention. If certain parts of the convention are weak, then surely the entire convention itself must be a very precarious weak one. Another overlapping function between the executive and the legislature is that of delegated legislation, i.e. Uh, law made by executive bodies. Now, delegated legislation is actually the bulk of English law. So let's just think for a minute. Parliament, the legislature, is the primary lawmaker. They're supposed to be the primary lawmaker in, in two ways, really. The primary lawmaker in the sense that they are the main body, lawmaking body. They're the primary lawmaking body and the primary lawmaker in the sense that they create primary law, primary legislation. Now, they are supposed to be the primary source of law, yet the executive, uh, executive made law composes the bulk of English law. So delegated legislation composes the bulk of English law. And so that's a very manifest, clear overlapping function. They are essentially doing what Parliament should do.
and this can have absurd consequences as shown in the case of DPP and Johnson where a bylaw prohibited the, uh, the act, I think it prohibited singing within 50 yards of a person's home. Now, we need to ask ourselves this, would Parliament create such an absurd law? Probably not. Uh, they probably would have taken into account the effect it would have had on society because they are specialist lawmakers. They are sp they, they, they know what they are doing. They are specialist uh, in making law. However, there are checks and balances regarding delegated legislation as well. Uh, firstly, delegated legislation can be declared void through judicial review. And this is essentially what happened in DPP and Johnson. So uh, they held that the... The, the, the delegate legislation was ultra vires it had gone beyond the powers uh, conferred and so it was no longer valid and this also happened in GCHQ I'll be talking about that case in another video uh, on judicial review later on in a quite a fair amount of detail because it's very important it's a very important case uh, in relation to judicial review furthermore the 1932 report of the committee on ministerial power suggested that delegated legislation has a practical effect uh, it suggested that without delegated legislation law that, that, that society will be a mess that law wouldn't be made as effectively the reason being is because uh, bodies like local councils that make by laws they have specialist knowledge uh, but um, bodies in general that make delegated legislation usually have some sort of expertise or specialist knowledge that parliament does not have and so uh, delegated legislation is practical without it the law may be a mess and it uh, it may not be as effective uh, another check balance is the statutory instruments act 1946 which says that uh, that uh, statutory instruments should be formally published and in accordance with the rule of law which itself can be argued to be a check or a balance because pr uh, principles such as equality uh, justice fairness these are principles that are associated with the rule of law and the fact that they must be formally published shows that people will be aware of their provisions and so uh, the, the body that enacts the statutory instrument is going to be cautious as to what they actually uh, include within it however even if a statutory instrument is not formally published uh, that does not uh, affect its validity as shown in the case of crown against sheer metal craft so if a statutory instrument does not comply with the publication procedure it may still be valid and so in the end the executive still gets their way despite having committed uh, an offense and so is that really a check? Is that really a balance? So that brings me to the end of this video. I will be releasing part three on the separation of powers within the next few days. I hope you gain something from this one. So be sure to check out part three.